It's early spring. The sun is just going down and the robins have finally stopped singing. All you can hear is frogs and crickets in the woods. Then, out of nowhere, you hear a loud, odd noise. Despite the sun going down, this bird is getting ready for one of the most dazzling displays of the spring. However, this fascinating bird is in trouble, along with a lot of other birds along the east coast, and the clock is ticking to help save them. The American woodcock is a well-known bird to many birders in the northeast, and goes by many names, such as the Labrador Twister, Bog Sucker, Mud Snipe, and Timber Doodle. Despite its many colloquial names, the woodcock has fascinated birders and hikers alike. And of course, walking out through the backwoods there, and you're just uh, trudging along with a chainsaw in your hand and a measuring stick, and boom! It, these birds would crop out and jump out in front of you. They're trying to be like woodcocks. They would like just hide there until you almost step on them, and then they'd just take off on you. Despite the American woodcock being a sandpiper, it is rarely found on beaches, and is instead found in woods. It has left its sandy colors behind to blend in with the leaves on the forest floor. With their sandpiper beak, they probe into wet soil to grab worms and insects. So the beak tip is really, really flexible. It's able to move and real sensitive to, um, you know, with a lot of nerve endings, it's sensitive to probably movement. It can probably feel that and, and can grab. And oh, actually, the kind of cool that their, their eyes are situated really kind of very much to the sides and, and pretty high up so they could see predators kind of above them. Because of the movement of their eyes, their brains are now upside down and their ears have moved to below their eyes. Woodcocks are sometimes seen bobbing as they walk. It is believed they do this so they can detect movement under the ground. Their breeding behaviors are even more peculiar. The males do what is called the sky dance. First, they paint turning around to make sure any female around them can hear. Then, he flies up nearly 300 feet in the air, circling. His wings whistle as he flies, and he lands nearly exactly where he started. It, well, what's kind of cool is that sometimes you can um, sneak up when they're in the air and kind of go, if you see where they're, or you hear where the sound is, and get pretty close to, to where they land, if, if you can hide. The females lay their eggs in an interesting way. Their first nest will always contain four eggs. However, if that one is destroyed, she will only lay three eggs. If that one is destroyed as well, she will only lay two, and then one. The number will decrease as the season goes on, as she understands she may not be able to provide enough food for four chicks so late in the season. The problem is this bird is in deep trouble. It requires a certain type of habitat known as young forest. This forest provides clearings for the woodcocks to display in, and woodland to nest and hunt for worms and insects. It is also beneficial for other animals, while mature forests do not. Fully grown forests don't give enough space for larger animals. Although many birds use mature trees to nest, they need the berries, nuts, and seeds that grow in the young forest where the sun easily shines. It was thought that old growth forests were not good for woodcock, and they really aren't, and for other species too. But and there's many species that need the same habitat as woodcock, especially the New England cottontail, and many, at least 47 and more. Unfortunately, this type of habitat only makes up a very small percentage of forests. These type of forests have no chance of appearing with humans around. People don't realize that in order to manage, you might need to clear a section of forest. You know, and Long ago, there were sections that were cleared even naturally by fire. But we don't, we don't clear, you know, we don't have fires anymore, <laughs> um, primarily. And it burns everything right down to the ground, and then it rejuvenates new growth. Um, it really helps the soil, too, because Native Americans actually used to do that a lot in Connecticut. In Nahantic, not too far from here where we are in Westbrook, um, that was a, a typical practice that the Nahantic Native Americans used to do all the time. Because of their decreasing habitat, 0% of their breeding range is stable. Climate change has also greatly affected woodcocks. One, one thing that kind of can hit their population, you know, occasionally is um, we have some really bad storms recently. We had a really big snow after a really big warm spell. So that, you know, earthworms are probably up towards the surface and then this huge blizzard and cold snap uh, came in. That can give them a time when there's hard to eat, nothing to eat, 
and they have to eat their weight every day. And there were a lot brought into uh, rehab facilities. Central Park got in like once in rehab, or got in like a hundred birds. That is why it is essential for people to put out not only bird feeders, but plant bushes and trees that will attract insects for birds and provide shelter. You know, the American lawn is a biological desert. So we need to rethink our own yards for, um, for birds and other wildlife. Although it may seem counteractive, controlled logging and forest fires actually help woodcocks and other birds. It gets rid of old trees and supplies rich nutrients for young plants. Patches of trees can be cleared away to provide open areas for the woodcocks to display and for new plants to grow. These methods create a young forest habitat, exactly what woodcocks need. In many wooded wildlife refuges, such as Stuart B. McKinney National Wildlife Refuge, this is being done. Well, here at Stuart B. McKinney, what we're doing is uh, field cutting. So that is increasing their habitat. And just by doing a little bit of it, um, increases it tenfold over. Um, but we noticed this year we had five woodcock at the programs. We used to have many more. We used to have at least 12. And then it dwindled down to just one a few years ago because they weren't cutting the fields. Now they're starting to recut the fields and all of a sudden, right away, we saw that they were coming back. With the woodcocks coming back, something has to be done to make sure the population stays and is closely monitored. When scientists are studying birds, they hang up mist nets. These nets are hung up in places where birds are flying. The birds will fly into the net and get stuck. We hide off to the sides <clears throat> near the nets and the male will come in, start doing his painting, and then we hope he'll fly into the nets. Even females will come down when they're coming down, they'll fly into a net. So then we get the net, get them out of the net, we bring them over to the processing area, we'll call it, and we tag them by putting bands on their ankles, recording all the information, um, and then we'll put the radios on their backs. And that's done with an adhesive glue, doesn't harm that out, them at all. And then we go around later on in the season, well actually we already started doing that, with the radio telemetries holding them around and uh, doing that to find out where they are. Patricia's work is important because she can figure out if there are any factors harming the woodcocks. She can also help protect certain areas that have nests to ensure healthy and safe growth of the chicks. It is important for birds like the woodcock to be saved. Like all birds, they are essential to our ecosystem by preying on worms and insects. Without them, our ecosystem could be damaged. By saving woodcocks, we can also save more birds on the East Coast. Many other threatened and endangered birds rely on similar habitats. If more people become interested in birds like the woodcock, maybe we'll be able to save just more than them.